Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this is our last speaker in our speaker series. Thank you all for being flexible and joining us for these last couple of days doing these Zoom meetings. Um, as always, feel free to provide me feedback if you loved it, if you hated it, if you wanna see a particular topic, shoot me an email and let me know and we'll see what we can do about getting those scheduled to keep the speaker series going. Um, our speaker today is a good friend and a great mentor, Dr. Jeffrey Bewley. He trained me, so if you don't like anything about what I do, it's his fault. He is now working with Alltech as their dairy housing and analytics specialist. And before he gets started, Elizabeth is going to talk to you a little bit about what Alltech is and what they can do for you. Yeah, um, Liz, you can hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Good. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, I definitely wish that this was an in-person meeting as, as planned previously, but I, I'm sure that we will have more of those um, in the future that, that you guys can attend. But I think this is a really cool way for us all to, to take a rainy day and, and, and learn a little bit uh, that hopefully can be utilized on your farm. Um, Alltech, you know, this is kind of a logical partnership with us and was at UT and um, to really kind of highlight some areas on your farm that uh, maybe may not have a huge cost associated or uh, just a new way to look at things that maybe can have a, a, a decent impact on on what you're trying to accomplish. So um, I want to thank you guys for being on today, taking the time. Um, Alltech, you know, I, just a, a brief just about us, you know, we're an animal health and nutrition company based out of Kentucky and um, we don't sell direct to farm. So the way you utilize our stuff is through your feed company and your feed provider. And I would almost bet that the majority of you guys are probably using something of ours and probably don't even know it. Um, so uh, all these services like uh, John Winchell spoke on, on Monday and then Jeff or Tuesday and Jeffrey speaking today. Um, we kind of all text competitive advantage is basically uh, trying to find a way to add service and support to the products that we sell and uh, really, really support producers on the ground level. So if there's anything you hear or, or someone that you feel, you know, John fo focuses on forage, Jeffrey on analytics and kind of troubleshooting. Um, we have some Hispanic worker training and some, you know, uh, milking equipment specialists. So if there's something on your farm that you just want another set of eyes, feel free to reach out to me. I know my, my contact information will be in what Elizabeth sends out at the end. And uh, we're happy to help, we're here to help. and. Um, I'll I'll lead on with with Jeffrey. So. Okay, great. Thank you all. And thanks to Dr. Ackerkamp for helping organize all this for us. We certainly would have rather been in person, but it's the safest thing and the best thing for us to do it in this format. I know everybody has a lot of stress and concern about what's going on in our world right now. So hopefully things turn around for us fairly quickly. My name is it's Jeffrey Bealey and I'm with Alltech. I'm the Alltech Dairy Housing and Analytics Specialist and I'm going to talk to you today about how we can change the dairy game through analytics. And analytics basically is, is how we use it and we analyze and, and visualize the data that we have in our dairy operations. I see a tremendous opportunity sitting in front of us for the use of both new and old data sources. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about this morning. So I would describe myself as a, as a long time dairy data geek. I have been into dairy since I was a little kid. You can see me there feeding a calf. I can tell you that calf was number four. I remember all those things better than I do more recent things, but I've um, been in love with dairy for my entire life. And there you see a picture of me with what now looks like an antique computer um, where I was working as a teenager on developing spreadsheets for my grandfather's dairy farm. And so I was into data for dairies way before I should have been and uh, really been interested in how we can best use data for our dairy farms for, for many, many years now. And I think we're on a, a new horizon for what we, we can do with data. So if one of the questions that, that I would ask early on, particularly if we were sitting together, is how much time per week do you look at your data? And as I've talked about this topic around the country, I've seen that that number varies quite a bit. 
very few people spend less than 30 minutes a day looking, or sorry, 30 minutes a week looking at data. And it's not uncommon to find that, that some farms are spending two to 10 hours per week looking at data. And one of the things also that I've found is that you, you think, well, I'm not really a data person. I'm not a computer geek or whatever, but you can be a data person without necessarily being um, a computer or technical person. One of the dairy producers that I've worked with a lot for a number of years said, I'm, I'm not a data person. This is not a topic that's interesting to me, but he said he spends more than two hours a week looking at his DHI data in printed format. So I think the, the take home message there is you don't have to be a data person. Uh, so you, you don't have to look at data on your computer to be a data person. We see lots of things coming across our, our media now talking about how big data and, and various terms, we may use the terms big data or business intelligence or inter internet of things or precision dairy or analytics. There are a lot of terms that we use to kind of describe this data movement, but no doubt that th there are huge new opportunities sitting in front of us for how we use data on our dairy farms. And if you look, this is not limited to dairy. This is something that we see all around the world. And it's easy to find books that dig into this topic in great detail about how we can use data as a source of competitive advantage, how other industries, including sports, use data as a source of competitive advantage. And we're going to dig into that metaphor a bit more here in, in a little bit. I was speaking to a farmer recently who said some of the things that I talked about really resonated with him because he said, my competitive edge comes from looking for pennies. And I look for pennies of opportunity and those pennies turn into dollars and those dollars turn into hundreds of dollars. And he said, data is the way that I can help myself be more competitive because it tells me where the opportunities are to either have a positive impact on my revenues or my cost of production. Data provides us the opportunity to work smarter rather than work harder. It provides that point of differentiation and data can help to uncover new solutions to help improve profitability. Hey, Jeffrey, we can't hear this audio track at all. Okay. So this is a, a video that shows kind of how, how people are using technologies to monitor dairy animals and transmitting data automatically and, and showing text messages about what's going on with the cow. And, and I, I show this commercial because I, I find it interesting that I saw this commercial not in watching traditional uh, dairy type of media, but I found it just watching uh, watching sports one day. And that it wasn't an Alltech or a Zoetis or a Gia, a company that we're, we're all familiar with in the dairy industry, it was Dell that was presenting this commercial because in actuality, a lot of the major players in information technology like Dell and Google and Microsoft and Apple are behind the scenes on a lot of the new technologies that we have coming about in our industry. And we look at this, this graphic, it, it shows a number of the different companies are, are getting involved in the livestock technology rev, revolution. And you can see here companies that I'm sure quite familiar with, companies that have been around for decades, but there are also companies that you probably have never heard of before. And I think that this is interesting because we see a lot of new players coming about in animal agriculture that are getting involved in the technology arena. Some of these players we're going to see come and go, but some of them are going to become predominant players in our industry because they're looking at data in new ways and really, I think, doing some pretty exciting things. So some of the, the data revolution fits in the area that we call precision dairy monitoring. Precision dairy monitoring basically involves monitoring something in the milk, something with the behavior of the animal or the physiology of the animal or the conformation of the animal. 
And with precision dairy monitoring, generally what we're doing is we're monitoring the same variable across time and looking for deviations. We're using a management by exception type of an approach. The best example and the easiest example to think about for precision dairy monitoring is the estrus detection technologies that, that are out there. So we're generally looking at some indicator of behavior of activity, and we're looking for a massive increase in activity associated with that when that animal's in heat, and that helps us know when to breed that animal. And that's extended to many other areas, including a lot of disease detection capabilities. And so we look at these technologies, we go around the cow, we see lots of opportunities to use devices. Many of these are based on something called an accelerometer that measures motion in three dimensions. We have neck tags that measure things like rumination behavior, eating behavior, uh, and activity. We have ear tags that measure those same things, may also get into measuring real-time location, telling us the exact position of the animal at all times, and may also give us some information about the temperature of the animal. We have leg tags that measure lying time, standing time, the number of times the cow gets up and down uh, and gives us an indication of, of number of steps. There are even Fitbits essentially for the tail to be able to look at, at cat detection to be able to tell when to, uh, when to start looking at an animal because she's getting ready to calve. Then we have devices that sit in the reticulum these devices may measure things like temperature and pH. Devices that, that sit in the milking parlor, they're monitoring the milk. So we might be looking at things like fat, protein, lactose, somatic cell count, progesterone, BHPA. There are a number of different parameters that we can monitor within the milk. And then we have image-based technologies looking at things like body condition score. So all these are technologies that are available to you today as dairy producers to help monitor animals for health, reproduction, and, and well-being. Also, some really neat things coming along. Uh, for example, NEDAP has a technology they call augmented reality. So basically, with this technology, you wear these glasses that you put on that you put on that that really can display the information about the cow in the air. You don't have to have a device, a smartphone, or anything to be able to look and see what's going on with the animal in terms of reproductive status, stage of lactation, et cetera. I think that's pretty neat and fascinating technology, although perhaps a little bit pricey at this point in time. People within our company, some of my colleagues, Pat Crowley and Derek Walwick, are, are using drones now to take silage inventory. So silage inventory has always been a, a challenge, certainly Operation, understanding where we are in terms of inventory is, is really important and we can use drones to be able to help identify that. So I think really a neat opportunity there. We can also use these technologies to create what I'd call cow responsive environments. So if we have something like temperature coming from a room and temperature bolus, then we can use that to tie into our control system for our fans and our soakers so that we're listening to what the cow has to tell us about heat stress rather than just listening to the outside temperature. So I think we can really create a better environment, more responsive to the animal's needs with these kinds of technologies. And we have new technologies like a company called Soma Detect. It's a startup company based out of Canada that's developing a technology that can measure somatic cell counts in milk, but also looking at being able to do pregnancy detection in milk. So really completely changing the game in terms of reproductive and, and mastitis management for our dairy industry. We can also use something like image analysis to be able to monitor the movement of the animal's legs, uh, looking at the position of each leg as it lands to be able to identify cows as they're becoming lame. Or we see new technologies that are monitoring video behavior, so cameras, looking at, at the animals using facial recognition type technologies, being able to identify which animals are where, when they're eating, how much they're eating, potentially even getting into things like estrus and lion behavior. And that's kind of where we're headed. I think we're going to see more and more of those kinds of new technologies come about. But in actuality, I think the biggest opportunity that we have in terms of dairy data management is in the untapped potential of existing data. And that's what we're going to spend 
the rest of our time here this morning talking about is how we can better utilize the data that we have already. And I'm a huge basketball fan. I'm a Kentucky native and grew up a Kentucky basketball fan and, and love basketball. And this is probably a little bit sad time for me not having any March Madness this year. But I think that there's a lot that we can learn from what the basketball world or the sports world has done and how they use data to change the way that the game's being played. And it really doesn't matter whether we're talking about basketball or baseball or football or hockey or cricket for that matter. We use data in new ways and that's changed the way that the games are being played. And I think there's a whole lot we can learn from that. So many of you may recognize the player here in, in this image, it's, it's James Harden. And James Harden was the leading scorer in the NBA the last two seasons. He has been really, by quite a margin actually, leading the NBA in scoring. And it's partly through the use of data, through statistics and analytics. So I often ask here, what's the most efficient shot in basketball? People throw out terms like, like a three pointer, or they'll talk about perhaps being able to look at a dunk. But in actuality, when you really look at the statistics, the most efficient shot in basketball is to get fouled shooting a three pointer. Because if you're a good free throw shooter, and in this case, James Harden, I think is about an 85% free throw shooter. If you get fouled while you're shooting three pointer, you get a chance to shoot three shots that you have a chance of making. He's really mastered the art of getting fouled shooting a three pointer. What he does is he kind of kicks his leg out a little bit and makes it look like the other player initiated contact and he shoots about 15 free throws a game. So one of the reasons why James Harden is the leading scorer in the NBA is because they've used statistics to help him determine what the most efficient shots are to shoot, and it's changed the way that the game is played. The Houston Rockets shoot a lot of three-pointers. They basically don't shoot two-pointers unless they're very close to the goal, and it's changed the way the game is played. We can also look at this in terms of technologies. So you can see here on the left, we have technology monitoring movement. And on the right, we have technologies monitoring animal movement. So there's quite an analogy between the types of technologies that we have in the dairy industry and basketball. I also think we can think about how we can use statistics or data to identify who the efficient players are. So on the left is one of my favorite cows, cow number 1363. Cow 1363, there's nothing flashy about her. No one really knew her name. She was a high production animal. She was feed efficient. She didn't get sick very often and she bred back quickly and she lived to an old age. That's the kind of player on a dairy farm that I think most of us wanna have. We wanna have that efficient player that we don't necessarily always notice. On the right, we have a player who, when I ask the question of audiences, most people say they don't know who he is. Um, that player is, is Danny Green. Danny Green currently plays for the Los Angeles Lakers, and last year he played for the Houston Rockets. But unless you're a hardcore basketball fan like me, you probably don't know who Danny Green is. There's nothing flashy about him. He's not James Harden. He's not LeBron James. He's not Zion Williamson. He's somebody that most people don't know who he is. He doesn't necessarily score a lot of points, but he does score when needed. He plays great defense. And simply put, when Danny Green's in the game, his team is more likely to win the game. 20 years ago, somebody like Danny Green might have had a challenge even staying in the NBA because he didn't look so great looking at, statistics, at general common statistics. But when you put the whole package together, he helps his team win games. And so we can use data to help identify the players like Danny Green or the players like 1363. Last year, Danny Green was the most efficient player in the NBA. 
we can also think about this in terms of looking at data dynamically. So on the left, you can see if it's a video game, and with the video game, they have little bubbles above everybody, everybody's head that says what's their percent chance of making a shot based on where they are on the court. And as they move around the court, that changes. Well, I think we have the potential to do that with the lactation curve for an animal. So we have the ability to use data based on what the animal has actually done or animals that are similar to her have done so that we can identify her likelihood of conception, likelihood of survival, likelihood of getting a disease or recovering from the disease and so forth across the lactation so that we can make better decisions about each animal. So I think about a lot of times, what's the ideal time to get a cow bred? We usually work with a voluntary waiting period of 50 or 60 or 70 days. But we can also look at that and think, well, realistically, probably not everybody needs to get bred then. We know that we have some animals that we're drying off now, make milking 80 or 90 pounds. What we'd really like to know is what would they be milking in 220 days? 280 day gestation period minus a 60 day dry period so that we could predict where that animal is going to be at the point that she dries off if we breed her today. And from that, we could move to the point of having individualized voluntary waiting periods. And with data and advances in software, I think that's where we're going to be moving to where that decision on a small farm, you may be making that decision already, but on a large farm where that's automated. So we basically have a, an automated decision that tells us when to breed each animal in the herd. So how do they do this? How do they use data in sports? Well, they basically take old data and they look at it in new ways. So they create new statistics based on old statistics. We take something like effective field goal percentage. Effective field goal percentage takes into account that a three-pointer is worth more than a two-pointer and it creates a metric for that. So basically this says that if, if I'm a 50% two-point shooter, and a 33% three-point shooter, that's essentially the same thing, and it adjusts for that within the ranges of that. There's another variable called value added, which calculates what's the value that a player adds to the team above what his or her replacement player would add. And then there's the player efficiency rate. This is the statistic that Danny Green does so well on. It's an overall rating of a player's per minute statistical production. And you look at that slide and you look at that equation, it looks really complicated. It takes into consideration a lot of statistics, but all those statistics are statistics that we've been recording in basketball for years. It's just creating a new way of looking at that data together. How can we move that to the dairy industry? Well, it's looking at old data in new ways. We can look at new analytics, new numbers like money corrected milk, which is a revenue based metric that considers the value of the components that each in the milk price for that individual farm. So, this is a metric that the RMS came up with, and I think it's an excellent metric to consider that the animal, what she brings to the table, varies depending not only on her milk production, but also on her, her fat and protein percentages. Or we could look at something like longevity corrected milk. Longevity corrected milk basically adjusts the milk yield to a herd distribution of 30% first lactation, 20% second lactation, or 50% third lactation. And I'll give you an example of that here in the next slide. Or retention payoff. Retention payoff is the value of a cow's future net revenues compared to her replacement. So this is similar to that value added statistic that we have in, in basketball. This is an example of, of longevity corrected milk. So basically you look at the milk production averages per group. In this particular example, let's say we have a first lactation average of 75 pounds, a second lactation average of 90, and a third and greater lactation average of 100. If we are in that herd and we have 60% of the animals in first lactation, 30% in second, and 10% in third and greater, <coughs> The average production for that herd is going to be 82 pounds. 
As we move across this slide, we move to where we have 50% first lactation, 40 down to 30, we increase the production average per cow. So by the time we get to the, the one on the fourth, which is the longevity corrected milk, where we have 30% first lactation, 20% second, and, and 30, 50% third or greater, we have a production average of almost 91 pounds. In this case, it's almost a nine pound difference in production per cow just by keeping cows in the herd a little bit longer. And I think that in some cases we've forgotten this, that one of the best ways to increase our milk production is to keep an older herd because older animals just produce more milk. Another metric that we can look at is something called the summer winter ratio. So Jenna Gwen, a colleague of mine at Alltech, who also was a graduate student at the University of Kentucky, she looked at this in, in her master's thesis. This was a statistic that was developed in Israel, and it's a metric that's used to quantify the seasonal effects on cow performance. Basically, the idea with the summer and winter ratio is we compare various metrics across the two seasons. The closer the ratio is to one, the less seasonality we have in performance. Basically, the, if the ratio is under one, then we have reduced performance. So we take the summer performance variable, divide it by the winter performance variable, and that's how we get the summer winter ratio. So we look at this, we have um, milk production, the easiest thing to think about. The top herd in the example here, we have a 51 pound average in the summer and a 62 pound average in the winter. In this case, we have a 0.82 summer winter ratio indicating an 18% drop in production. Or in the second example, we have a summer production of 57 and a winter production of 62. In this case, we have a summer winter ratio of 0.93 or a 7% drop in production in the summer. Obviously big differences in the reduction in milk production between these two herds. And this may indicate a difference in how successful these two herds are managing heat stress. In the bottom example, you see where this herd has a higher somatic cell count, somatic cell score in the summer with a 1.17 summer winter ratio. So somatic cell count would be the opposite of what we look at for most of the other metrics. And so in that study, Jenna looked at the summer winter ratios across all of the United States. Of course, we found that there were lower summer winter ratios in the warmer climates in the southeast and the southern plains. But what's more interesting, I think, is that when we look across each region in the United States, there's about a 10% difference in the summer winter ratio between the 75th percentile herds and the 25th percentile herds. What this says is there's a dramatic difference in the way that herds within each region manage heat stress. So the summer winter ratio provides us a new way of being able to assess how effectively we're managing heat stress. And I think we have to be careful in how we use it, make sure that we're comparing herds in a similar region. It's probably not fair to compare a summer winter ratio for a herd in Florida compared to a herd in Wisconsin, but certainly we can compare two herds in Florida or two herds in Wisconsin and get a good indication of how these herds are managing heat stress. And so we can look at that and benchmark that. We look at it in a few different ways. We look at energy corrected milk. We look at fat percentage, conception rate, service rate or heat detection rate, pregnancy rate, and somatic cell count. And by we're looking at these all together, we can get a good understanding of how that herd is managing heat stress. I also think there's a lot of potential to look at data sort of in a forensics way. We can look at data and try to understand how uh, this data helps us to explore a crime scene in a sense. And, and so we can do this before we have to think about some of the key limitations associated with data. First of all, we need to think about variation. Variation is particularly a concern in small herds. So I had a farm at one of these meetings recently that came and said they had 100% of their fresh cows had a high somatic cell count, but it was 100% of two animals. So I'm not sure how much we can really read into that. We need to remember that when we're looking at small herd data. 
momentum. Some things just simply take time to change. So if we think about something like the calving interval, it's a metric that I know I used to look at a lot for reproductive management, but there's a lot of, of time it takes for that to change. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a variable that lags somewhat. Lag is when there's some time between an event and when it's actually measured. And then bias is when we exclude or ignore data. So for example, if I could ask everybody in, in the room that's a dairy producer, how many of you have a ketosis rate of zero? If you looked at the data, most farms would probably say, that's my rate, it's zero, because I've excluded that data. But in actuality, every herd has some ketosis. I like this quote that says that data is the new science. Data holds it. But are you right questions? I think that it's important to remember that data by itself is fairly useless. It's being able to use the data to help understand scenarios that we can change and implement changes that can help us better manage our dairy operations. And with that in mind, I think it's important to remember that we need to understand something about the farm and cow situation to be able to really accurately analyze and look at a herd's data. If not, we can really make some bad conclusions. So recently I was looking at a herd they had a really high culling rate in the first 60 days in milk for first lactation cows. If I looked at that, I would see that as very alarming, but it was so high that it, it made me question. And I asked, I said, are you selling a lot of fresh heifers? And in fact, that's what they were doing. So if we just look at that data blindly, we think they have a problem, but in actuality, they're actually probably making money with that way of selling fresh animals. We talk a lot about KPIs in the dairy industry. So KPIs are key performance indicators. And I wanna dig now specifically into some of the KPIs that I think we should be looking at for our dairy operations. Here are six production KPIs that I think we should be monitoring now. The first one is money correct in health. Again, I really like this metric because it reflects the economics for each individual herd. If we're not looking at money corrected milk, we should at least be looking at energy or fat corrected milk in the market that we're in. I think we need to move beyond looking at just milk. We do get paid for fat in, in basically all of our markets, and we get paid for protein in most of our markets. And, and we need to make sure that we account for those those variables. Otherwise, we may see things a little bit different than they are in reality. So I was working with her just yesterday, actually, that had a milk production level that they weren't particularly happy about. But when you looked at it on, her, on an injury corrected or a fat corrected basis, they were actually doing reasonably well. Then I think we should look at week four or week eight milk. Notice I don't say peak milk. Peak milk can be useful, but the problem with peak milk is that it can occur at any point in lactation. In actuality, what I'm really looking for here is, is how well are my cows starting off? And week four milk gives us a good indication of startup milk, how quickly are they starting up? And week eight milk tells me how well are my animals doing at the time when I'd like for them to peak, rather than looking at peak milk, which could occur at 150, 200, 250 days in milk. So I've moved away from looking at peak milk now and looking more specifically at week four or week eight milk. Then I'd like to look at the percentage of cows that are less than break-even milk level. We should really see that number be pretty small, but this is a good way of picking up some of the variation in milk production and then looking specifically at a report of which animals those are and whether they should remain in, in the herd. Next, I'd look to look at first lactation week eight milk as a percentage of mature week eight milk. This is an indication of how well our heifers are peaking. I think a really good measure to be looking at. And then I like to look at milk per day since 22 months of age. So this accounts for how efficiently are we producing milk after animals should be coming into the herd, accounting for how much time they spend dry, et cetera. Here are six reproduction KPIs that I'd like to monitor now. 
I'd like to look first of all at pregnancy rate. It tells us a lot about what's going on recently in reproductive management. I'd like to look at some conception rate breakdowns. So for example, looking at conception rate by days in milk, conception rate by technician. I think those can tell us a lot of the stories about what's going on in reproductive management. Days to first service, how quickly are we getting semen into cows after they first calve? And then percentage of animals that get pregnant by 150 days in milk, I think a really good metric to look at how well we're bringing all animals into the reproductive equation. Percentage of service intervals greater than 36 days, this tells us how efficiently we're detecting animals in heat for subsequent services or how efficiently we're resinking animals. And then the last one is the percentage of animals that we call because of reproductive failure. Sometimes we can make some of the other numbers look better than they really are, but I am in reproductive calls. So I think it's really important to track the percentage of animals we're calling from the herd because of reproductive failure. Next, we look at mastitis, and here are five mastitis KPIs I think we can be monitoring. The first one is bulk tank somatic cell count. It's rapid, it's frequent, it really tells us a lot about what we're actually getting paid for. But I think in terms of looking at mastitis status, I'd much rather look at new infection rate. New infection rate tells us more quickly what's going on in terms of uh, our management practices and how they're affecting whether animals become infected with a new case of mastitis. We can make a lot of management changes that are focused on prevention and they don't do anything to necessarily deal with existing infections. They just help us to prevent new infections. And so therefore I think new infection rate is, is a better number to be looking at. We can fake our bulk take somatic cell count by culling a lot of animals and therefore it may or may not be a good indicator of how we're dealing with mastitis. I worked with a herd recently that I, I made a mistake. They said they were concerned about their somatic cell count. They, I asked them what their somatic cell count was. They said it was, it was 110 or 120. And I said, don't worry, you're doing a great job. Keep up the good work. And we didn't talk about it anymore. But later I looked at their data and found that they had a 55% calling rate. So in actuality, they were probably right to be worried about their somatic cell count, but I dismissed it wrongly so because their bulk tank somatic cell count was good. We could look at the percentage of subclinical mastitis cases and track those across time or the percentage of clinical mastitis cases. And then again, I really want to look at the mastitis calling rate. I think that's a key metric. And if we're looking at mastitis management, we have to be looking at that, that calling rate. Here are some health and culling KPIs that I think we should monitor. One of the main metrics that I want to look at, if there were three or four that I offer, I want to look at the percentage of cows culled in the first 60 days a month. I think that number tells us a lot about how we're managing our transition program, and it tells us a lot about the financial success of the dairy. We know that if we call those animals in the first 60 days a month, there's a huge economic loss. And so we can track that number and help, that, help us use that number to manage our transition period. Death rate is another number that I look to, like to look at. I think it's a good indicator of animal care and, and we can be able to manage that to minimize our death rate. Heifer survival rate, also extremely important. It tells us um, how many of our heifers that, that are born actually end up making it into the milking herd. And then fresh cow disease incidents, another huge health KPI to be monitoring and managing. Those are all KPIs I think that we should already be monitoring. If we're not, we should be digging into how to be able to monitor those. These are KPIs that I think should be on your, your horizon. These are KPIs that I see industry leaders measuring. Not everybody's measuring these things right now, but we should be thinking about these more. First one, is dry matter intake in almost every large dairy that I work with is monitoring dry matter intake and feed efficiency on a regular basis. They're using some type of feed management software. And I think in the Southeast and among smaller dairy farms, this is something we could do better at. There aren't as many people around this area that do this well. 
genomics, being able to use genomics to help manage data and understand the genetic status of the herd. Also, I think very useful information. Real-time feed inventories, milking equipment analysis. Most of our dairy parlors now provide us a lot of information about milk flows and so forth that we're underutilizing. Parlor image-based or wearable technologies for health and reproduction. We talked about those earlier in the presentation. Real-time weather data, helping us to use that to monitor temperature humidity index and barn control. It's really not expensive to have a, a weather station in your barn. And I think that we should do that and use that data combined with other data more effectively because uh, it's an underutilized data source. We know weather affects cow performance, but we could actually track that and understand that more effectively. And then lastly, but probably most importantly, is just detailed financial analysis. I'm a very visual learner, and I think there's a lot of and, and looking at changes across time to identify differences in, in management, being able to track percentage of, of animals by different categories. So this graph looks at percentage of animals pregnant by days in milk. I think it helps us identify holes in our reproductive management program, being able to look at why animals are removed from the herd, being able to look at when animals are removed from the herd. So culling timing, this graph I think is, is a very useful graph for us. And then tracking disease incidents. Sometimes we don't record disease incidents all that well, but that's an opportunity to record more effectively. Um, I think that, that disease incidents should be recorded more often. It's also important that we look beyond averages. So in this graph, you can see a yellow line that shows the average, but the, the blue dots show the, the variation around that. And sometimes the variation tells us more than the average and we forget about variation sometimes. Here's an example of how if we're looking at the percentage of herd with fat protein inversion, you can see that the massive increase in this herd in the summer of, of 2018. This is telling us this herd maybe has some acidosis going on. And if we looked at this on an average basis, we wouldn't pick this up. That's where the percentage of animals deviating can be more useful. Within Alltech, we're working on something that we call AHA. This is an Alltech herd analytics program. And this is something that we're gonna be able to take data from multiple herd management software programs and pull it into a report to be able to create this, this sort of a diagnostic snapshot for your herd, indicating where you stand for a lot of the metrics that we've talked about today and providing a lot of those graphs so that you can have a quick, easy reference sheet to know what's going on in your herd. Just wanna show you a few real world data discoveries, how we can use data to, to analyze a herd situation. The first one is, is an example of how averages can lie to us. This is a herd that I was working with recently. Their average day's drive was 62, which sounds great. But when we looked at it a little bit deeper, we found that 37% of their drive periods were less than 40 days and 39% of their drive periods were greater than 70 days. So in actuality, they were bad on each end of that. They had a lot of short drive periods and a lot of long drive periods, and the two were canceling each other out in the average. But more importantly, we can look at and see how does this reflect in performance. And if we look, for example, at 305 day actual milk in the middle column, you see that their actual milk for the cows that had an optimal period was 26,000, but the actual milk for animals with the short drive period was 21,000. It's almost a 5,000 pound difference just by managing the drive period length. And this is reflected in ME milk and peak milk also, but this is an example of how averages can lie. And by looking at the data in this way, way we can identify a real big opportunity to increase production for this particular herd. Here's another herd that we were working with recently that had some conception rate problems. When we looked at conception rate by breeding trigger, we found two interesting things. First of all, they had animals that they were breeding based off a pedometer accelerometer system. That conception rate was a little bit lower. And we found that the reason for that was because they were actually inseminating animals too early with the heat detection system. 
And then on the other end of that spectrum, we had animals that were in the time DI program and they were given the, the GNRH shot at the wrong time. And so by looking at the data, we were able to hone in and increase the conception rate for both of these measures. And here's another herd that I was working with, a rather large herd. We were looking at milk by age at first calving. And you can see here that um, those animals that were calving in at 20, milk, 20 months of age really weren't milking that well. And certainly as we get older, we had an increase in production. And this herd, after looking at this data, shifted their age at first calving a little bit later to find a different optimum. And this is something that I think we really have to look at the data. It's very herd specific. It doesn't always like look, look like this for every herd, but we should identify the optimal age at first calving, not always smaller or larger. I also see a lot of opportunity to use data to help us manage our labor and equipment more efficiently, to use data and, and tools to help us with cow side management so we can use apps or phone apps or whatever to help us save time, improve accuracy, and reduce the paper trail on our dairy farms. It's also very critical to remember that KPIs are for everybody. Oftentimes we have KPIs like somatic cell count or pregnancy rate or whatever, but we don't tell the people that are in control of those processes what those numbers are. I think we should have boards like this. This was a herd that I saw in Brazil a couple of years ago where they posted all their KPIs for everybody to see. And really I thought, what a, what a brilliant way of helping keep everybody involved with managing the KPIs that they were in control of. Certainly this trend is, is continuing of, of more data and better use of data. I think it's important to remember that small dairies can also take advantage of this data. Too often we fall into the trap of saying that only applies to big guys, it doesn't apply to me. I think that's the wrong way of looking at this. Small dairies can use data just as well. Reality check is that biology and business management principles are not size dependent. We may change the way we use the data, but data provides a massive opportunity for small dairies in addition to large dairies. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that one of our challenges and limitations in the dairy industry is that we have a lot of data that sits in silos. This data doesn't always talk and communicate well to each other, and there's a need for more and better solutions to integrate data. And you can see there are a number of startups out there that are really trying to work in this area. I think in the future, we'll see a lot more data-driven dairy producers. And what does a data-driven dairy look like? She's somebody that understands basic statistics. She manages with KPIs and dashboards. She looks forward, not just backwards. She connects production to finance, and she treats data as an asset. So the next challenge I have is who's your CIO? CIO stands for Chief Information Officer. On your dairy, who is your Chief Information Officer? If it's a small dairy, then maybe just one of many hats that you have to wear on, on your dairy. And large dairies are moving to where this is actually a position on their farm. They have somebody that their entire job is to manage dairy data. And I think we're all going to have to think about how we best take advantage and utilize data through at least a part-time CIO on the farm. I hope you have some new insight into how we can use data for our dairy operations. If you have any questions about this, feel free to reach out to me. And I think we have a bit of time for questions now. Thank you. Yeah, we have a, a ton of time for questions. So if, if any of y'all have one, feel free to throw it in the chat and I'll relay it to Jeffrey. If you wanna unmute and ask it, or if you wanna use the hand raise icon, we can do that too. Can you hear me, Liz? We can. Uh, Jeff, what? What would be your, and this is more of an advice question, <laughs> what would be your advice on somebody like myself, we have multiple uh, 
data points that we look at, but sometimes I feel overwhelmed by looking at so many. How, how, what would your advice be to, to simplify that? Okay, that's a great, great question. Um, I think that it's, it's first of all to, to pick a few KPIs, and I think we need to move toward those KPIs being individualized. Your KPIs may be different neighbors or, or another competitor, but, but start with the idea of, of here's four or five KPIs that are really critical to my success or, or areas that I wanna be working on. So for me, you know, some of the KPIs that, if I'm picking four or five, I wanna look at, at some indicator of, of milk yield. And again, to me, that's money corrected or energy corrected milk. Um, I want to look at some indicator of reproductive efficiency. For me, that's going to be pregnancy rate first. Um, I want to look at, at some indicator of how animals are remo being removed from the herd, and that's percentage of animals in, that are called in the first 60 days to me, and then somatic cell count. If I had to pick four, those would be my four, um, but that may vary. Other people may have different metrics they want to look at, but I think if you just start with a few, that gives you a place to start. And then from there, you can start drilling down. So if you see that perhaps your, your pregnancy rate is not where you'd like for it to be, then we can drill down and identify uh, where we need to go from, from there. And I think it is important to drill down, but to start with a few like that is, is I think, the key. And then I think the other piece, and, and I think we'll have better solutions for this moving forward in terms of software that a software instead of providing a report that gives you 150 KPIs it identifies KPIs that are either deviating from where they have heard or identifying KPIs that are different from industry standards so that it really automatically focuses in rather than you have to look at 150 of them it, it says hey here's the six things that are changing right now and then you can look and determine whether or not those are positive or negative changes and how you want to address them. We have another question on here, Jeffrey. Would you be willing to share your PowerPoint? You stopped sharing your screen, didn't you? <laughs> I, I didn't mean to. Good job. Uh, would you be willing to share your PowerPoint? Um, I'm going to leave that up to, to Jeffrey, but if you're willing to send me a PDF copy of your PowerPoint, I'd be happy to share it with our listservs. Yes, that's fine. This is also being recorded and uh, we'll be posting it to the UT Dairy website after it goes through editing. All right, Jeffrey, another question. In the future, what do you feel that the split will end up on simple cow knowledge and management versus dairy analytics and decision making? I don't know a percentage, but I'd say it's probably close to half and half. I think if you're going to be good, you're going to have to still have good cow knowledge, good cow husbandry skills, and um, being able to read the cow and so forth. But, but you're going to have to look at data. I mean, I look at a lot of data for a lot of herds, and, and I'm amazed at, at how many things jump out quickly in the first look at a dairy. And um, people say, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that that metric was so far out, out of whack. And, and the thing is, um, the successful dairies do know. The, the, the most successful dairies, they are tracking those. And I, I work with a lot of dairies around the country that are really data driven. I mean, they're, they're keyed in on all their metrics and, and they have weekly reports that they, they pull that provide a lot of information and they, they share them with their entire management team, including consultants. Um, and I think that's the attitude that you have to take toward data because there's just, there's so much potential for better utilizing data to identify opportunities. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, I don't know if you can open the chat on yours, but there is a, a long comment that I think I might miss if I try to say it out loud to you. So if you can open that up and, and see this question. The gist of it is, is looking to see how averages can lie 
specifically going around uh, the incorporation of sex semen and raising less heifers. Um, a curious curiosity as to how we come up with the flat heifer cost of $2,500 per heifer, and wondering if that ignores the principles of fixed versus variable and marginal costs, and if we're a little bit misled on that actual cost per heifer. So looking at, I'm guessing, the cost of marginal, the marginal cost of heifers versus just a flat cost of $2,500. That's a, I, I think I understand the question. It's, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think that we use too many flat numbers in our industry. So you hear that number often that it costs $2,500 to raise a heifer or it's $3 per day for a cost of day open or it's $300 for a case of mastitis or whatever, whatever the number is. And, and part of where I think we have to move away, we have to move away from those kind of numbers because they're guesses or they're based on an average. In reality, there is no average dairy. So if somebody did some data and, and the 2,500 really came from a good study or, or a good summary, but it's different for every dairy. And in some dairies, maybe that's 1,500 and some dairies, maybe it's 3,500. Um, but the only way to, to move away from that is to be able to say, for my herd, this is what the actual cost is. Even cost of production, for example, you ask people what their cost of production is and, and people are gonna say a number that's probably whatever they most recently read in Hordes Dairyman. And we need to be able to, to identify what that is for, for my herd. Um, and you talk in your question here about, do we ignore some fixed cost and variable cost and marginal cost? For sure, if that, that, those were probably all in that 2,500 number but it's going to be different for each herd. Um, the sex semen, raising less heifers, uh, all that I think makes a lot of sense to some degree, um, but some of that hinges on the value. If we're talking even getting into using some beef semen, that hinges upon the value of that, that beef animal and we're finding maybe that's not as high as what people thought it was initially in their partial budgets and that, changes the economics of that. Um, but I think it, the bottom line is we need to be looking at these things on an individual herd basis to identify the true economics on each herd. Any more questions for Jeffrey? Uh, this is um, Samantha Cron. I have a question about the beef and sex thing. Can y'all hear me? Yes, ma'am, you're good to go. Okay. <laughs> um, Okay, so I know a lot of these bigger herds are doing the beef and sex semen thing. I'm wondering, I, I've started doing it in our herd and I've taken a hit on my um, my preg rate. So I'm wondering like what these bigger herds are willing, maybe they don't take a hit at all, I don't know, but um, like how much are they willing to let it drop? You know what I'm saying? Before they're like, okay, this isn't economical anymore. Can you describe what you mean by taking a hit on your pregnancy rate? Yeah, I mean, like we were running probably 28 when I was on conventional and now I'm in, I'm probably gonna be more in like the 24 range. Okay, so that, that's going, that you're getting a preg rate drop by going to sex semen as, as opposed to beef semen, is that what you're saying? Right, so we went from all conventional to sex, you know, sex, semen and beef. So some cows are getting beef and some are sick. Okay. Depends on who they're, they're mated to. Sure. So that also is an economic question and I think herd specific. Um, there is probably some point, I don't, and if I were to say a number, I would be wrong, um, of uh, losing some pregnancy rate where it's still economical to do that. Um, what that number is, I think, is, is herd specific. And I, I think that the reality is when you use sex semen, you are going to see a bit of a drop in, in production, or sorry, a drop in your, your preg rate compared to conventional semen. I think the keys are to, to see, um, you know, make sure you use as fertile of bulls as possible. And that goes for both the sex and the beef semen. Um, 
to that gap, but it's an economic question. 4% pregnancy rate drop, depending on your economics, may not be that bad when you're talking 28 to 24. If you were talking 14 to 10, it would be a, a bigger deal. Um, so I, I don't have a specific answer for you, Samantha. I think we could look at that number to really see what that impact is on your herd. Um, but my first guess would be that probably 28 to 124 is probably okay. Okay, thank you. Any follow-ups from anybody else? I'm not too much movement. So if there are any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask today or that you think of later, I'll be sending out Jeffrey's contact information after this presentation. You can also contact me and I will pass it along to him as well. Uh, thank you all so much for joining in. I know a few of y'all have stuck with us over the last three days with this meeting format. Um, like I said before, if there's anything that y'all would like to see or any uh, meetings that you'd like to have us put on during all this coronavirus craziness, please let me know and we'll be happy to try to set something up with that. Um, I hope y'all enjoyed this and got something out of it and a big thank you to Jeffrey and Alltech for helping us pull these together.